Welcome to the Jesus Movement Live. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, welcome to everyone that's uh, joining me here. And today we begin a new sermon series or teaching series. I often mention this, we tend to have habits of calling people who give sermons preachers and messages sermons. When the reality is, is that unless we're on a street corner proclaiming the gospel to somebody who doesn't know the Lord, we're in fact acting as teacher, rabbi. And the message is really a teaching, which is what the Torah is, the teachings or the Pentateuch, the five books of teaching. And so when we talk to those who have already given their life to the Lord, we are in fact not preaching and we're not giving a sermon. We are teaching and we are teacher. And so I don't like to get hung up on those terms, but I do like to mention it because often we have a mold, a method for which we stand in front of people and give the Lord's message. And often it's insubstantial because it doesn't really get into the word in a substantial way and it doesn't benefit people in a substantial way. And so today we're beginning a series uh, which is called The Law and the Prophets. And on here you can see an ancient scroll, a picture uh, which I've uh, taken in Nazareth in Israel. And it is an introduction today because we're going to give a framework for what is a lot of books of the Bible. And as it says here, all scripture containing the law and the prophets point to Jesus. Okay, that is the whole point. So when Jesus says to read the law and the prophets, he has a purpose in mind for doing so. And so we're going to go straight into scripture today. And I'm going to get you to go to the book of Psalms, chapter 1. And this particular scripture redirected my life at the age of 36. It was a scripture that the Lord gave to me as a subject of much prayer. When I asked him, Lord, what is my purpose? What is my calling? Not what people were calling me to do. Not what people of the church thought I should do. But Lord, what are you calling me to do? I had an old Bible I had since a child and I was given a page number, or just given a number, I should say. My assumption, of course, was to go and look at my Bible for a number. Not a strange number, not a hidden message, but just a page number, a simple thing. And so I went to my Bible, and when I did, I got to this page number, which had the, begin, the, the Psalm 1 on only, because it had a preface on the page. And when I read Psalm 1, it gave me the answer for what I was searching for at the time. And so this fir first portion of it, which we've got here today, you'll understand from what it says, why it's so important. So Psalm 1 verses 1 to 3, again Psalm 1 verses 1 to 3, says, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. This is the position of much of mankind. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Mm -hmm. Whatever he does prospers. Amen. So, what this is saying to us is that a person who reads the word and studies the word and as this word says, meditates on the word, means the person who dwells in the word of the Lord. And when you do so, it changes your life. So when this scripture says, he is like a tree planted by streams of water, the water is symbolic of the word. When you put your roots down into the word of God, your tree will grow in a godly way. And it tells us that when you do, it will yield fruit in season. Which means sometimes before we get to the outcome, we have to invest into the journey itself in order to see what the Lord has for us at the end of it. So sometimes we may begin our journey with the Lord in sincerity 
and find he may not even use us for another 10 or 20 years. Hard to think, isn't it? But the thing is, he is asking us to prepare ourselves in order to serve him. Now, most things in life that you do, if you want to become something, you usually have to study or learn how to do it first in order to do that task. When you get to the point where you have the capacity to do that task, you can then be someone on the forefront who perhaps develops something new for other people to learn in the future to be at the forefront of the same task. However, everybody has to start at the beginning. And we have two books in our Bible that start and say in the beginning and one of Genesis and one is of course the book of John in the New Testament. And so we find that sometimes we just have to go back to scratch and start all over again and the Lord will give us fruit to bear. If you're going to walk in the life of other people, you think about what Jesus did. He came and gathered his disciples. What did he do? He taught them. In his teaching, he actually walked his journey with them. He showed them what to do. He gave them the confidence to do it. And he also gave them the tools to do it. And then when he left and ascended to heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit to give us the tools to do the same as he gave to his disciples. And so we find that as a consequence of the journey, then there is a time that you will bear fruit. Okay. So sometimes one of the problems that we have when we start things is we can't wait to start. We can't wait to get going. And so when we do so, we get going, but we might make mistakes. We might even offend people. And so this is the thing about being zealous. We can be overzealous and underprepared. The Bible gives us insight and understanding. The only way you can glean that knowledge is by reading the word itself and yes you will bear fruit because then when you're with other people then when they ask you questions you will be able to answer them and answer them with the truth not with your version of it the scripture then goes on to say whose leaf does not wither so that means that when you receive the word of the lord not only do you bear fruit in season, but you will be healthy in the Lord for the rest of your life. Your leaf will not wither if you continue to read the word. If you put your Bible down and stop reading the word, your leaf will wither. In other words, it's a non-stop occupation. Like anything you do, you have to keep practicing what you do in order to do it well. So to be a Christian means to dwell in the Word, as it does for a Jewish person as well. It is the foundation of who we are. And when Jesus was challenged by the Pharisees and others, the teachers of the law as the Bible calls them, he would always say, it was written. Take note, he wasn't carrying a scroll under his arm. He said it was written, in other words, he knows exactly what was written. How can he know? Because he studied and meditated on the word. Now you might say, hang on a sec, he's God, so he knows everything. Yes, but he was brought up as a child first. He was 30, the Bible tells us, when he received the Holy Spirit. He used to go to the synagogue. He went to the temple, remember when he was 12 mm. and his parents left and he was still behind conversing about the scriptures. In other words, he grew up and he learned the scriptures in the same way that you and I do today. So don't make any mistake about that. And so he would say, it is written, how can he say that? Because he had his own insight and understanding as a man of the flesh because he was brought up in the word. And so it is for us today. And finally, it says, whatever he does prospers. Why does it prosper? It's not because of he. It's because he is in the word. He is fed by the word. He's bearing fruit for the Lord. And his leaves are not withering because he doesn't walk away from the word. Mm. And so on that basis, everything you do will prosper. Mm. Okay? So the Lord will bless you. In other words, he's always with you when you are with him in the word. It cannot be a part-time occupation. 
being in the Word is a full-time occupation. It should be part of your life. You know, we've seen lots of memes and posts on social media where they say what it would look like if you treated your Bible like you did your phone. <coughs> if you drove off to work one day, you didn't have your mobile phone, most people would do what? They would turn around and go and get it. If you went to work one day without your <coughs> Bible, do you do the same? <coughs> When you get up in the morning, do you flick open your screen and check what's been said on Facebook before you no, start your day? No. Or do you flick open your Bible and spend some time with the Lord and the Word? And we can keep on giving examples, but the reality is, sadly, that this is very, very true. And we can see this because the nature of what gets posted on social media are all just bits and pieces from the Bible. How much greater would it be, instead of just sharing the same things that each of us have got, to actually dwell on the Word with the Lord yourself, rather than just picking one to get other people to like it? Mm -hmm. They should all like it. Yeah. I mean, it's silly, uh -huh. isn't it? But this is the world that we come to live in. So let's now go to Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. So Matthew 5, verse 17 says... Do not think that I have come, so this is Jesus talking, that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Okay? So Jesus has come to fulfill the law and the prophets. Now when being questioned by the Pharisees, Jesus gave his what's called his greatest commandment. So we now go to Matthew 22, verses 34 to 40. So Matthew 22, verses 34 to 40. It reads, Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, said, so this thing here always gets me. One of them an expert in the law. Mm. Right? Today we get sent things and people say, oh, you know, you really should watch this because this guy's a professor. An expert. This guy's an expert. Mm. This guy went to Bible college. Mm. This guy did this. This guy did that. We have the same thing happening here. Mm. Tested, an expert tested him, tested Jesus nice. with this question, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is, Love your neighbour as yourself. And then he says, All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. All of the law and the prophets. So in other words, if you don't love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind, then all 613 commandments of the Old Testament are out the window. There is no point. And this is the problem with the expert in the law. He may know what it says, but does he exercise it in this way? In the second component here, he says to love your neighbour as yourself, which means that to have a true, unconditional love for the Lord means you have to love your fellow man exactly the same as you do yourself. Mm. And so whilst people are busy reading their Bibles and then gossiping, slandering and all the rest of it, you would have to question how do they position themselves with this sort of scripture and what Jesus says because he's basically saying that all of it hangs on these two commandments. So if you're incapable of fulfilling these two commandments, then you're going to have a problem clearly walking with the Lord. It's fairly blunt and it's fairly simple, but in it all, Jesus doesn't give you a hit list of every book of the Bible when he says this. He just says the law and the prophets. So in Psalms we read that it was to study the law. Jesus says... Don't think I've come to abolish the law or the prophets, but to fulfill them. And here he says all of the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. 
So my first question to you today is Jesus says he came to fulfill the law and the prophets. What does he mean? To show them that he's the Messiah. Right. Very good. So he came to fulfill because, and why is that? So you've given me the, the answer. What's the behind that? What brings you to that conclusion? Because they wouldn't listen to him. Because, yeah. because they wouldn't listen to him? They kept going off track and worshipping idols. So what is the Old Testament for? As we call it, I should say. To show the way. Right, because all scripture points to Jesus. the Messiah. So therefore he would say, once he's arrived, that all scripture points to me. So in other words, he has come to fulfill the scripture not to abolish it. In other words, he's not ushering in something new that replaces the old. No. He's ushering in something new, but the old still applies. Yeah. Right? But he's ushering in something new because the problem with the old is that people were experts in the law, but they weren't doing with their heart, soul, mm. and mind mm. in a sense of love. Mm. And so he has to bring in this new... So my next question is, Jesus also says the law and the prophets hang on his first and greatest commandment, which we've just read. So what do you think? What do you think he means by this? Put him first. To put Jesus first? Mm. Above all, above all, everything. Against everything else, otherwise all the rest isn't right. Yeah. Any other thoughts? It's not a trick question. Just, <laughs> just what what you think? By if you really study them, you'll see that they are they all actually lead to the Messiah, which is Him, and that He right he can, through Him He fulfills all what the prophets have said about Him. Right. So when He gives you these two new commandments, and He says that all of the law and the prophets hang on them. Jesus spoke of this, and I to say, so we're not going to use every example, but Jesus spoke of the law and the prophets on numerous occasions, and when he said he came to fulfill them, he spoke of his absolute perfection. So in other words, yes, it all points to him. Okay. So in other words, he's not somebody who falls short in any of the commandments whatsoever. He's not someone who doesn't fulfill everything that the prophets had said the Lord would do in the future, that the Messiah would come, who he was, what would happen to him, and all the rest of it. So after his resurrection, when Jesus was on the road to Emmaus, he, he spoke with two of his disciples. We just did this recently. One of them is called Cleopas, and another one isn't named. So it's not one of his... 12 disciples as some of his other disciples and he said everything written about himself in the scriptures began with the law of Moses and the book of prophets so in other words all scripture pointed to himself the same passage also contains a threefold division however on the Old Testament where it actually talks about the law of Moses, the prophets, and it actually has an additional one, and it says the Psalms. So when he spoke to these two. So whereas most scripture only gives us what we call the twofold division, which is the law and the prophets. So in this one instance, suddenly he adds a third to, to this. So this brings me to ask you the question, which books of the Bible are included in the law and the prophets. Firstly, which books are the books of the law? And secondly, which books are the books of the prophets? Just keeping in mind that Jesus has just given us a threefold division. The law, the prophets, mm. and Psalms. So what does that tell us? Any thoughts? Well, it's the Torah, which is the first five books. Very good. So the first five books of the law, or the books of Moses, is the Torah. So that's clear, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, the law of the prophets, obviously, all the, uh, like Isaiah and Amos. They are the prophets. Yeah. Right. So the, the, the law of the prophets. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Um, okay, so all the prophets that we call prophets, like we uh, that have their own books. So in other words, we have the major and the minor prophets, if you want yeah. to call it that. Right? Uh, but then we the says the book of Psalms. David, yeah. So why are the why does Jesus mention Psalms? Do you think? Well, David actually, although he was a king, he was still a prophet. And right. Many people didn't sort of associate him mm. as a prophet. Right, and his prophecies were about Christ, the Messiah. So in the mm. Psalms, we find messianic prophecies. Mm. Not all prophecies were messianic. Mm. Okay. Mm. Well, you have mentioned this before. A lot of the prophecies were warnings to the people at the time. Mm. The Lord said, you must correct your ways, otherwise a punishment will come. Mm. The Lord also said that if you don't correct your ways and the punishment comes, then the Messiah will come at a future point because you don't correct your ways. Mm. So we have that threefold pattern happening throughout the Bible. Okay. So the, the thing that we find here is that suddenly, where we may have a notion of there's two categories of what Jesus is saying, there's actually three. Mm. What about all the other books of the Old Testament? We've highlighted Psalms because Jesus highlighted it. But do the other books count in this as well? Yeah. Do you think? Of course. Of yeah. course. And the of course is because? Oh, it's in the Bible. It's now we're talking... It, it, well, it's, it's showing that, that everybody sins and that God corrects and throughout the, the whole of the Old Testament. It's a circle of... Everyone. Yeah. The circle of sin, the sin cycle. Yeah, the <coughs> sin cycle, yeah. yeah. Everyone plays so. a part. But it, but it also um, shows a generational to leading to Jesus, which right. is also a fulfillment. Right, very uh, good. From Abraham. Yep. So, so, so let's go through this. So the books of the law are also known as the books of Moses. And they're also known as the Torah in the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh. Or it's called the Pentateuch in the Old Testament of the Christian, Christian Bible. So we've got enough names yet? Okay. So it can get a little bit confusing. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put up a chart here. And there's a lot of information on it, so I hope you're able to see it, but I will point it out. This chart that I built examines the difference between the Hebrew Bible and the Old Testament of the Christian Bible. Clearly, there's no New Testament in the Hebrew Bible. So the Hebrew Bible is called the Tanakh, and the Old Testament of the Christian Bible, of course, we call the Old Testament. So let's just start off with this. The word Tanakh. Does anyone have any understanding of what Tanakh means? So if you have a Bible which is translated from Hebrew to English, so a whole one up here, it's called the Tanakh. Complete? You got four? <laughs> So if you don't know, it's okay. You can say I don't know. <laughs> or you can guess. You have a teacher. That's okay. All right. So let's so let's explain this. Right? In the breakdown of the Hebrew Bible, we have, as mentioned, the Torah, which is known as the Law. So there's five books in the Torah. Right? We know them as Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Here we have what's called the transliteration. So in other words, it's the English version of Hebrew, so we can pronounce what they actually are. And so the first one is called Bereshith, which actually means in the beginning. The second one is called Shemoth, which means the names. Vayikra, and he called. Badmithbar, in the wilderness, and Devarim, the word. So these are actually what they actually mean. So, if you have a look at some of them, they're obvious. In the beginning, Genesis. In the wilderness, you might think that belongs to Exodus, but actually, the time in the wilderness goes across multiple books. Right? So we find that coming up in numbers. But anyway, so those first five books, we know them as the Pentateuch, and the Pentateuch is because in Greek, and pent in Greek, 
Okay. It's five and tush means teach, so it's the five books of teaching. Mm. Right? Five books of law, five books of teaching. Okay? So we find the two similarities. Now when we get into the rest of this, you can see I've colour coded all of this. And the reason I've colour coded it is because this colour code represents the Hebrew Bible and this colour code represents the Christian Bible and as you can see the order is not the same. It is mixed up. Mm. And so the first category that we have is called the Nebium, which is what we know as the prophets. So when we're talking about Jesus and him saying that we should know the law and the prophets, you may think, oh, okay, well, that means this and this. Okay? But there's also what's called the Ketuvim, which is the writings. Now, if you look here in the prophets, there's some books of the prophets that's Christians. You may not think of them as prophets. You will usually recognize what they call the major prophets, which is Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. And then you have the 12 minor prophets, which is Hosea, Job, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Naham, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. And so these are in the same order, both in the Tanakh and in the Christian Bible. The order of those books doesn't actually change. Mm. However, the position of this whole block of prophetic books mm. sits in a completely different position in the Hebrew Bible because it actually sits in the middle whereas in the Christian Bible it sits at the end mm. okay now when we look at the prophets they're divided into three different areas they're called the former prophets which is Joshua Judges Samuel and the book of Kings okay then we have what they call the latter prophets major, which is Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. And then we have the latter prophets, the 12 minor, which are the rest of them. So they're split up into three different categories. And so what we're actually saying here is that all of these people here, or what's represented in these books, are considered as prophets as well. They were hearing from God. They were, what happened during the time of Judges? Did they hear from God? Did any of the prophets, did any of the judges hear from God? I'd like to think there's only one no, answer there. So. Yeah. Yes, you said the right answer. Yeah. Of course. There was many leaders who walked away from God, but there was also those during that time who heard from God. Joshua led them into the promised land. Did he hear from God? Yes, he was to go in the tent with Moses before they even got there. Okay, and then of course we got during the time of the kings and of course Samuel. So Samuel of course spoke to God just before the kings started, didn't he? He said, Lord, can we have an earthly king? And that's where the scripture comes through where the Lord says, I am your king. I'll let you have it. And Samuel saying, woe is me because I feel like this. And God saying, well... Now you know what I feel like, because this is how it's always been. I am their king, and yet they will not acknowledge me. So this is the structure here. Now, the third category is called the writings, the Ketuvim, and it's broken up into three sections. first one is the three poetic books, and they're Psalms, Proverbs, and Jobs. Now, in um, Hebrew, it's called Sifrei Emet, which means truth okay so they're those three books and then we have what's called the five megawatt or the hamesh megawatt which means five scrolls okay so in those we have the song of songs the book of ruth lamentations ecclesiastes and the book of esther then we have this other category which they don't have an exact title so they just put down under other books and that's daniel Ezra and Nehemiah, which we have as separate books, are actually one book in the Hebrew. And then, of course, we have Chronicles, which is, means the words of the days, because that's what a chronicle is, right? It records what actually happened. Now, Chronicles we have as one and two Chronicles in the Hebrew Bible. There's no one or two. Mm. Okay? Ezra and Nehemiah are the same. The book of Kings, there's no one and two. The book of Samuel, there's no one and two. 
they're all just one book. And that's why we have some confusion in teaching sometimes, because what we find, like in Samuel, as I've taught, is that the time of Samson and the time of Samuel was actually the same time, but one sort of finishes on one book and the other starts on the next book. It's almost like they've been arbitrarily divided. And yet scriptures tell us that both of them ruled during the time of the Philistines who ruled over Israel for 40 years. Each of them ruled for 20 years each. Mm. So in other words, they were in that same period of time, they were alive at the same time. Now when we come over to the Christian Bible, you can see that it's really jumbled up almost, isn't it? We go Joshua and Judges, and then we have the insert of the book, Ruth, which comes down from the five megalot. Then we do the 1-2 Samuel, 1-2 Kings, then we do the 1-2 Chronicles, Ezra and Nehemiah, and then we insert Esther again from the five scrolls, and then we have the three poetic books, then we insert two more from the five scrolls, two of the uh, major latter prophets, then another insertion of a scroll, then Ezekiel again, another latter major, and then we have Daniel from the other books, and then we scroll down through the 12 minor latter prophets. No, we're not confused. Why do you think the Christian Bible was assembled different to the Hebrew Bible? To confuse it? No. <laughs> <laughs> it may be, but there is a purpose. What do you think is the one thing that combined that together in a different order? Time. Time. So in other words, they've made an attempt to put this into chronological order. Chronological order of when it was written and when it happened, mm -hmm. not when it was not what was prophesied for the future. Okay. However, as we're going to discover within this, there is still some error because some of the minor prophets, for example, are actually not in the same order as they actually placed in the Bible. And then within books themselves, we find sometimes that. There's chapters and verses which are not in order chronologically either. So yes, it can be really confusing, but this is a, an attempt, obviously many, many years ago, to structure it in such a way where you could open your Bible at the front and read it like a book through to the end. Mm -hmm. This is what their attempt was. So I hope that this chart helps you to sort of get your head around the Bible and it also gives you an understanding of the difference between the Hebrew Bible and the Christian Bible, not in terms of scripture, but in terms of structure. And also an understanding that when we're talking about the law and the prophets, it's very easy to take that twofold division and say it's those books <coughs> and it's those books that we should be considering. Many people wouldn't even consider the former prophets. They would take the five books of the law they take the three major prophets and then they would take the 12 minor prophets in that description. So again, without insight and understanding, what you believe Jesus is saying could easily be different to one another without being taught. Mm -hmm. And then of course we have all of these other books here. But we know, for example, that Daniel saw Jesus. Daniel was prophesying constantly, a major, major prophet of the Bible. And yet he's just down here in other books. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. Ezra and Nehemiah had major functions, right? But they were there because they knew what was going to happen in the future and they had to fulfill tasks in order to have the future look like the Lord wanted it to be. But they were operating in the here and now in these circumstances. Right? The book of Chronicles is basically a repeat of the book of Kings, excepting it was written during the time of Babylonian exile. So this was when very few people had survived, 40, 50,000 by memory, and the, the scriptures were left back in Jerusalem. And so they, they thought, oh, we better start to write all these down again, otherwise we may forget them. And of course they wrote them, they're similar, but they're not exactly the same, which is what you'd expect if you wrote something at a different time from the original form. Okay. Now when Jesus first called Philip to follow him as his first disciple, do you remember what he did? What did he do? Follow me. <laughs> no, that's what Jesus said. <laughs> what did Philip do? Jesus spoke to him and what was the first action that Philip did? He 
he ran off to? I to tell his friend. Yeah. Nathaniel yeah. Bartholomew. Yeah. I knew you had it on the tip of your tongue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he identified, this is the point, he identified Jesus of Nazareth as the one the law of Moses and the prophets spoke about when they looked into the future to identify the Messiah. So, if they did not read their scripture or know it, could they have done that otherwise? No. No. And so, what happens here is we see a connection between the old and the new, Mm. where they immediately recognize from their insight and understanding what was happening there right now in front of them. Of course, good old Bartholomew says, nothing ever good ever comes out of Nazareth, mm. right? Mm. But however, Philip was absolutely convicted that Jesus was the Messiah. So um, let's go to that scripture. It's from John chapter 1, verse 45, just a short scripture. And it says, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and the prophets also wrote about Jesus of Nazareth. So Philip is the one who puts a name to the fulfillment of the law and the prophecy. Okay? So we might just take that as part of the conversation as we're reading that book, but the reality mm. is, is that's a huge marker of identification mm. that Philip pronounced to another person, this is he. So the prophets, although it may seem odd, actually incorporates all Old Testament scripture with the exception of the first five books, which of course is the law. It may seem odd that poetic books like Job or Proverbs are included in this category, but just as Jesus was a Jew, it was common for Jews to see any writer of scripture as a prophet. Why? Why do you think that is? What do we say about scripture? What is it? The word from God. Right. It is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Mm. So in other words, all scripture that's considered the canon of scripture is inspired by the Holy Spirit and therefore it is the word of God. And so basically, Jesus is not saying, just know these bits really well. He's saying, know all of it. Now, this is his commandment to you and I. So we have a great phase in Christian history where people said, well, don't really need the Old Testament. And there's still those who say the same today. You know, I just got the Gospels. That's all I need. Mm. I got everything I need to know. And yet, if you actually read the Gospels, Jesus tells you, commands you to know the law and the prophets. And so I don't know how people are able to read what Jesus says and discount what he says and say, we don't need that, we only need this. If you are a follower of Jesus and you are convicted in your faith, Mm. then one would assume that you would choose to want to know and do everything he commands you to do. And so this is part of that journey. So where do we go from here? In this series, I am first going to focus on the minor, or the minor latter prophets, that are found as the last 12 books of the Old Testament. So I'm going to ask you, why are the 12 latter prophets called the minor prophets? I know some of you might know the answer to this. Why are the 12 latter prophets called the minor prophets? Is it because they're less important? No. Why do you think? What we're finding out here is that the Bible has a structure to it and it's very practical. Just like God created us in this world to live in a physical world, many, many things are practical. Even though it is filled with spiritual content, It has a practical application in how it is ordered and given to us. There is nothing wrong with that. 
We know that God is a practical God. Why? Because when he began to create, it says on day one, he did. On day two, he did. So he had a practical order in creation because he knew there was no point in creating plants and animals if there was no water and there was no land. Mm. There's no point putting fish onto dry land. Right? So in other words, each of his steps had a prescribed program of application that was required in order for them to succeed. And so in our written word, there is a practical application and process by which we can also read the Bible. Okay, And so unfortunately, we tend to find in, I, I can't speak for ancient times, but in modern times, we find that there's many books of the Bible that really don't get read very much. Mm. Right? Church messages tend to focus around certain popular messages that have been given for hundreds of years. And whilst they all have a place, I'm not saying they don't, the whole story is not really being given. It's said that, well, we can't do that because there's not enough time on Sundays. <laughs> Well, I think we're giving it a pretty good shake at the moment because it's really important that we actually learn all of it. Okay? And this is where we have to take away that notion of sermon from teaching. Because sermon means that you have to preach that you'll be saved by Jesus in every single word. And of course, that's where it all points. But the point is every word points to that from the Old Testament. And so we need to know that as well. So... So this simple reference to the size of the books, because the Word of God cannot be diminished. It doesn't matter how long it is or when it was spoken, every Word of God comes from God himself. So we don't say, well, that Word's more important. We do this in, in modern times, isn't it? Someone said this and someone said that. Oh, well, we need to consider that first because it's more important. We would never do that with the Lord. Right? Everything he says has the same worth to us. Okay, so I mentioned earlier about the word Tanakh, um, and I'm going to uh, put up this chart again. I'm just going to explain that the word Tanakh is a Hebrew anachronym, a combination of the word Torah, Nevian, and Ketuvim. Okay? So when we look at the word Tanakh, we've got T-A, then we've got N-A, and then we've got K-H. We're saying this in English, by the way. But that word, those first two letters, the second two letters, and the third two letters represent the Torah, the Nevium, and the Ketuvim. You can see the T, the N, and the K, and that's what it is. It's actually an acronym combining the three sections of the Hebrew Bible together. So probably the simplest way to explain it to you in English. Now I've got a nice easy question for you. Who can name all 12 minor or latter prophets? Hosea, Joel, Micah. Oh, very good. She's got my eyes closed too. Habakkuk, kick gang. That's four. Ruth. Ruth is not a the Italian one, Malachi. <laughs> Mal Malachi. <laughs> Zechariah. Zechariah, very good. Um, Jonah. Jonah, very good. <laughs> Haggai. Haggai, we said, but very good. Um, <laughs> I won't pay you anymore. But you've done you've done well, you remember a few. Do you think that if you were intimate with the scripture, that you would just be able to rattle those off perhaps? Mm. So if I said to you, what's the first four books of the New Testament? What are they? John. John. What's the next book? Luke. Yeah. We've already said that. Sorry. No, you're all over <laughs> Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what comes next? Oh, Romans. No, no Acts. Acts. Then Romans. Then Romans. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So can you see what familiar, familiarity does? Yeah. You know, mm. if I asked you to say what the first five books of the Bible in, in order, 
If I actually block oh. the order, mm. you may actually... Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus... Well, the more we study, the more we should know. Yeah. Very good. But the point, my point is, right, is that familiarity would mean you would remember them and it would also help you to find where they are in your Bible. So if I said, can you please turn your Bibles to mm -hmm. such and such, if you were recognising the order well, you'd have an approximate place where you'd go to in the Bible to find them, right? So if I said to you, find the book of Daniel, who does Daniel come after? Because he's given the last prophetic words, isn't he? So he comes after Ezekiel. Um, of course. Who does Ezekiel come after? Think about the order of the actual prophets and when they were there. Ezekiel comes after Jeremiah. Because Jeremiah. Jeremiah and Ezekiel were functioning at the same time That's as Daniel. Right. All three of them were alive at exactly the same time. What about Isaiah? He comes before them. You understand? So if you start to sort of rationalise and you understand their lives, the periods of time they function in, you can almost piece together the order of the Bible. So you'd be able to very quickly say, so if you open your Bible and you came to Ezekiel and you look for Isaiah, <coughs> you know you go forwards, right? That will help. Right. So, of course that will help, but you've got an index in your Bible too if you actually open a paper Bible, so that will help you too. But my point is, is that familiarity makes a big difference to understanding the Word of God. Okay. Okay. Now, I've sort of mentioned this a bit earlier, but does the order of the books represent their order in time? Clearly, they don't in the Hebrew Bible. There's an attempt to in the New Testament, but when we get down to the minor prophets, we find that it slips up, so to speak. Now, some of this may actually be a consequence of not under having insight and understanding. So in other words, those who set the order back in time didn't actually know exactly when some of the prophets were mm. alive. Sounds really odd, doesn't it? It doesn't sound like that sure. could be possible, but you sort of wonder why. So when we go to, um, to have a look at this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put up three charts to help you to understand the order of the minor prophets and it's got the majors on there as well and a couple of others but so let's just start off so first of all what we know as prophets books of the prophets all prophets were there during the period of kings and so as you can see i call this kings and prophets so of course the first king that was appointed and anointed by god was saul or shawl or saul and what happened was, is he disobeyed God, and so God sidestepped him, and he anointed David. Of course, Saul's son wasn't very happy about it, so he came and contested it for a couple of years. But he was defeated by David, and David united the kingdom of Israel. If you notice here, there is no prophets whatsoever during this period of time. Okay? Then we come down to Solomon, right, and being contested by Absalom and Adonia, and we find again, still the United Kingdom of Israel, and there is no prophets. But of course, Solomon makes a mistake of marrying 700 wives, <laughs> and their influence on him draws him away from the Lord in his later years, and he starts to build altars to foreign gods and foreign idols. And so, of course, what happens is he... What can we say? He gets to live out his life without it being changed during his lifetime, but then he says during the life of his son Rehoboam that the country will be split. And so what happens? He gets split into the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Israel. The northern kingdom of Israel takes all of the tribes but uh, one because by this stage we find that the, the tribe of Simeon has been absorbed into the middle of the kingdom of Judah so it says one the tribe of Benjamin which um, is right at the top of the tribe of Judah where Jerusalem is is also absorbed and so we find that Rehoboam and the scriptures tell us 
that he will keep one tribe and Jerusalem for the Lord. Why? Why is that? Because to fulfill. Right. The Messiah has to come from Judah, right? Mm. And so he will keep them for the Messiah. And so we go down this merry path where Jeroboam kicks off as the first northern kingdom of Israel. And what does he do straight away? What does he do? He worships the gods. Right, he built two golden calves, the Mm. same as those when they came out of Egypt. He put one at Bethel on the southern boundary of the northern Mm. kingdom of Israel and he placed another one at Dan at the northern boundary Mm. of the northern kingdom of Israel and he said to his people, these are your gods. Mm. He did not want any of them going down to Jerusalem to the temple. And so from that point on, he separated his people from God thereafter. In one decision, that man destroyed 10 tribes of Israel, took them away from God. The one tribe that was left over, of course, Judah, continued on under Reba. So as we go through these leaders, we get down to the time of Abiah in the southern kingdom and Nadab in the northern kingdom, still no prophets. And then we get down to the time of uh, Bashar and Asa, and suddenly on the southern kingdom of Judah, we find that Joel and Obadiah appear. So both of these prophets are the first two minor prophets to function, and they're functioning in the southern kingdom of Judah. And this is what you'll see, see, because some of the prophets are aligned to the south, and some are aligned to the north, because God has a purpose, because he's speaking to both kings on Mm. both kingdoms. Now, as we go through this, you may notice there is a large number of kings changing hands here because they like killing each other all the time. (laughs) Whereas on the southern kingdom of Judah, their lifespan tends to go for a lot longer. If you might notice that whilst Joel and Obadiah are functioning, we have an extended period of kingship under Asa, whereas we have one, two, three, four, five changes in the (coughs) northern kingdom. It's during this time of Omri and Ahab that Elijah and Elijah are doing the work of the Lord. They've been set apart by the Lord. And so they're operating in the northern kingdom of Israel, not in the southern Mm. kingdom of Israel. And so they remember they're fighting the prophets of Baal and Ashtoreth. Okay. And so this is a, 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 a dire situation in the north because they've walked away from the Lord. So we get down to Jehoshaphat. So flipping on to the next chart, we find that the time of Elijah and Elijah is uh, shorter for Elijah, but of course longer for Elisha makes sense, right? Because Elijah was taken up to the Lord. So Elisha functioned for a lot longer. So he's rolling from Ahab, Ahaziah, Joram, Jehu, Jehoahaz down to Joahaz. So we've got numerous rulers changing hands again in the northern kingdom. And in the southern kingdom, what do we find? Jehoshaphat, Jehoram, Ahaziah, Joash, Amaziah, all the way down to Uzziah. And what do we see? No prophets whatsoever. Mm. So what we find happening is we see these periods of time in which God's kings are walking with him better and sometimes worse. Right? Each time we, we come to a new king in the Bible, mm. it says that he was doing evil in the eyes of the Lord or he was doing right. good in the eyes of the Lord. Mm. And so this is reflected in where he places and positions his prophets. When we get down to the time of Uzziah, the beginning of his reign, we still have no prophets. But over here in the northern kingdom, suddenly, at the time of Zechariah, we have Jonah, Jose and Amos. So we have three prophets who are all functioning at the same time. Okay. Now if you read it all along here, you'll see assassinated and assassinated. <laughs> this one for six months, this one for one month, and then we go to this Menachem, and we notice that there's three prophets in action at this time because it's chaos. That's right. Kings are being assassinated, people are worshipping foreign idols, We've got the foreigners who are coming in, the Assyrians who are looking to take them over. So God's sending the, the warning bells and saying, yeah. hey, you guys, you really need to sort this yeah. out. 
otherwise you're in trouble. And so we have the imprint of three of the minor prophets over yes, here. Yes. When we come to this third and last chart, here's Menahem and Uzziah again. The Bible tells us in the very last year of King Uzziah's reign that Uzziah is commissioned to be a prophet. And that's in 740 BC. And you see Isaiah is there for Jotham, Ahaz, and also Hezekiah. So he's there for four, alive during four different changes of kings. Okay, now we're getting into this phase here where the kings aren't doing so good in the southern uh, kingdom anymore. But over here in the northern kingdom, Menahem goes to Pekahiah, who's assassinated by Pekah, who's assassinated by Hoshea. And so what do we find? Basically assassination, assassinated, short periods of rule. And then the Assyrians under King Shalmaneser, they conquer, conquer the Israelites of the northern kingdom and they take its people captive to Assyria. And this ends the period of kings in Israel altogether. But we find after Hoshea, after they've been taken away, Nahum is actually at work in the land of Israel, former land, you would call it now, of the king, northern kingdom of Israel. And so he prophesies in this period where there is no king functioning in the northern side. So interesting. So that means that what we read in this book should reflect the circumstances, right? Mm. So this gives us a bit of a, a picture. Yeah. Now over here, during the time of Isaiah, who we consider a, a, a latter but major prophet, we have Micah during the time specifically of King Hezekiah. Okay, so he comes into this role. Right. Then we have Manasseh, who is deemed the worst king of all, right? Who slaught, who set to fire his own son. Then we have Amon, who is assassinated by the palace officials. And then we come to a good king by the name of Josiah. Right? During the rule of Josiah, we see Jeremiah coming into effect here. And Jeremiah is another one of the major latter prophets. He's actually there for four kings again, just like Isaiah was. Mm. But at the same time, we see Habakkuk and Zephaniah in action here as well. And so there should be a purpose connected to Jeremiah, connected to the king and the politics mm. of the time in this time. Now, we see that Josiah here was killed by the Egyptians. So this is the point in time where they lose control of their own country and the Egyptian ruler places his own king on the throne, right? And that's Jehoiakim. But before that happened, the people elected Jehoahaz, and but he only lasted for three months, and the Egyptian king took him down to Egypt with him and placed his puppet on the throne. So this is a period of turmoil for the southern kingdom, and it's a change which they'll never recover from. And we're, so we see what again? A lot of prophets right. aligned at that period of time. Mm. When we come down to Jehoiakim and Jehoiakim, then we're in the very end times of the southern kingdom of Israel. Zedekiah, of course, is the last king, and he's replaced by a governor called Gedaliah at the end. But during his time, we've got Jeremiah, Daniel, and Ezekiel functioning. So you may recall that Jeremiah sends his letter to Daniel, talking about the prophecy message that people get so wrong today where he tells the people you're going to stay there so you have your children be prosperous etc etc right so we've got these two interacting one is placed in jerusalem the other is placed with the people in babylon in exile god has his prophets with both of them and of course ezekiel comes into play just after the beginning time of daniel during the rule of jehovah so major events are going on here and we have a lot of prophets that's one two three of the majors and two of the minors all play here and then here after Zedekiah, we have Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Mm. So in other words, after Babylonian exile, we find that these people come into play. Mm. And so they actually come into play during the time of the Persian rule. So in other words, the prophets that were with them during the time of the Babylonians are here. And then these minor prophets are aligned during the time of the Persian rule when King Cyrus the Great brings back the people. Okay? And so, of course, what's written in their book should align with that circumstance that's mm. in the Bible. Okay? So that's an oversight. So as we go from book to book, 
we're obviously going to be understanding and reflecting on the circumstances and who's in power and the words that God is giving to those people should reflect the circumstances of what's actually going on, right? Makes sense? So that should help you to understand those books. It also helps you to place where the books are in time. And you'll find that these books are notoriously full of warnings. So again, much of the prophecy of the Old Testament is warnings for the here and the now, but there's also words in there that says, this is what's going to happen in the future if you don't or when you don't. And so we get that future look at it as well. Okay, so I hope, so again, a big organisational teaching, and I hope that gives you some understanding of the Bible itself, the structure of the Bible, the fact that Jesus asks you, commands you to know and read your Bibles. Right? And so this is what we're doing. We're fulfilling his commandments as we stand here right now. By a Hebrew Bible. Well, the Hebrew Bible, this is a Hebrew, uh, so yes, certainly, this is a Hebrew English. So this was translated by a rabbi. So this has been translated straight from Hebrew to English. So the words in English here have some variations on the words that were... Would you mind just closing that? Sorry. So the, so the words in here, we're going to see some differences because... The translation goes from Hebrew straight to English. Mm -hmm. The history of the Bible tells us that the translation went from Hebrew into Greek and it was done in Alexandria in Egypt. Mm -hmm. Then it went into Latin and then it got translated into various forms of other languages and English, of course, mm -hmm. early English. And so you're reading things which have multiple changes of language. Right. So people today often will tell you that you can only read certain versions of the Bible because they're the only true and correct versions. So I'm sorry, but that is just not true. And if they had the insight and understanding and actually learned Hebrew and learned Greek themselves, they wouldn't be those proponents who are saying that that is the case. Mm. They're just taking second-hand information. Yeah. We have people saying, oh yes, but NIV has taken certain scriptures out of the Bible. Well, actually, if you read the NIV, you'll find that there's things that have been added into the Bible. They were never there in the first place. Right. So we've got different publishers, different owners of that company. But does the word of God itself change is what you have to ask yourself. So for the Old Testament, this is an Old Testament. So don't buy this thinking you're buying the whole Bible. This is only an Old Testament because it's Hebrew to English. It's not Hebrew and Greek. This is done by a rabbi, a Jewish man. Okay, it says inside who, who the translator is. So this will give you a wonderful translation from Hebrew to English, and it has Hebrew script, Hebrew script in here as well as English. Mm. And so that will give you something which is going to be closer to what you should be reading than perhaps some of the others. You have to realize that language is embellished so in Hebrew, there are many, many words which only have one word, whereas in English, we translate them into multiple versions of the same word. So let's use an example like, like the word huge. You know, we can have massive, huge, large, big, gigantic, all those words, but they all describe the same thing we would choose which one of those words we would use depending on how big we wanted to make big, right? Mm -hmm. That's English. That's not the Hebrew. C. C, right, right. perfect. In the Bible, C. Right, so the word C in the Bible, mm -hmm. the Sea of Galilee has never ever been a sea because it's landlocked, it's a lake. And there they call it, in modern times, they call it the Sea of Galilee or the Lake of Gennesaret. It was called a lake during the time of Jesus. Right. It was also called the sea during the time of Jesus. So mm -hmm. what I'm saying is that their word is only one word. Okay, So we have ocean, we have sea, we have different scale words again. Roads. You know, the ancient roads are called ways. It's the way to this and the way to that. Mm -hmm. Now we have highway, road, cul-de-sac, street, mm -hmm. avenue, lane, lane <laughs> boulevard. Mm -hmm. So, so sometimes you're walking around going, okay, so which is the big one and which is the small one? That's how they're trying to, but in the original Hebrew, 
they don't do that. Mm. So. And so what happens is, is that we enter into a lot of language is, is unnecessary. So if I want to be really plain, the original language doesn't actually have any vowels. So in Hebrew, there is no vowel. So today we have this word called Yahweh. Y-H, so Y-A-H-W-E-H, right? That's how we use this word to describe God. However, in Hebrew, they don't use a W, so it's Yahweh. They use a V instead. Let's take it back one step further. No one could pronounce the word. So a rabbi in the past added an A into the between Y and H, and the same rabbi added an E between the V or the W and the H. So we had a word that could actually be said. So today, people said you say you're not meant to say the word God because if you read in the Hebrew scriptures or anyone writing Hebrew, you'll see they put G underscore D with no O in the middle and they say oh yeah but that's because you're not allowed to pronounce the word God not true Mm -hmm. they can't pronounce the word God because they don't use any vowels Vowels. so don't get caught up in all of this stuff that people want to say as Christians who are ignorant of the parent language Mm. okay so if you want to say Yahweh without the vowels Go for it. Try and say it. <laughs> it's impossible. So it was simply done and allowed us to pronounce a word. Yeah. No one's committing any sin here. Mm. So we have to realise that we live in a time where people like to declare things as right and wrong all the time, or you're a Christian, or you're not, based on these nonsense things, but they don't have the insight and understanding to know for themselves. And they didn't write a New Testament for what reason? Because they're Jews. Because they're Jews. Right. Got so, <laughs> so it's oh it's that simple. <laughs> okay. So the New <laughs> Testament's written in Greek, and so if you wanted a direct translation, you go from Greek to English, which we do have. So our New Testament is pretty much true and correct, but you may notice sometimes there's words in there that are Aramaic, right? So when Jesus is on the cross and he said he says Eloi Eloi Shabachthani, it is Aramaic because it was a language that was spoken in the region. It's from Aram, which is today Syria next door. Okay, Jesus came from where? The Galilee of the Gentiles up north. And so the language of Aramaic was spoken in that region. So he would know that language. So once again, it's all just differences in language. So mustn't get caught up on this is right, that is wrong. Yours is authentic, yours isn't. But if you want something that's truer to the word, then you know, go as direct as you can. Go from Hebrew to English and go from Greek to English. Don't go from Hebrew through an ancient Greek into a modern Greek, which then passes through Latin into ancient English and three or four version changes of ancient English into modern English, mm. and then turn it into American spelling and then declare that it's no longer the word of God. Mm. Rubbish. Okay. What we find changing in the Bible are the interlinking words. The ifs, the ands, and the buts. Okay? The words that are descriptive can change according to people's um, translations. Uh, We have the, uh, what's the long Bible version? Uh, Is it the New International? No, no, no. no. No, It's it's the ex. The new one. Universal. No, no the one that people... Expanded or something like that. Yeah, there's, there's a version of the Bible which is about three times the size of every other Bible because they put so many adjectives and verbs into it <laughs> that they, people really enjoy reading it. But it's like writing a novel now because it's been manipulated and changed to embellish it. Mm. The New Living does that as well. But right. Uh, so the point is that the Bible is not there to satisfy your imagination. Mm. It is actually just a statement of what is said and what happened and so we stick to that okay so in conclusion today so it's a good discussion um, and it's important that we actually talk about it because people are being badgered to feel that they're doing something wrong or not buying the right version and it's just not right at the end of the day and you have to examine the heart of somebody who would tell someone else that that doesn't work I get told it all the time and when I answer people back they actually don't know what to say because the reality is they're so busy peddling this nonsense right. that they actually don't have the answer themselves because all they did was get it from someone else. Yeah. How foolish is anyone who doesn't examine the source of information and pass it on as if it's fact? Mm. Never do it. 
So in conclusion today, Jesus instructs you to know the law and the prophets. In essence, he is telling you to do as Psalm 1 tells you to do, study your Bible day and night. Knowing that you have the opportunity to hear what God has to say through the written word is a privilege. Being blessed with the means to read the word, written word is a gift like no other. And reading the written word will not only change your life, but the life of those around you. Next week, as we embark on a journey through the 12 minor or latter minor prophets, we're going to start with Jose. Realise that what has been recorded is God warning his people to stop sinning and change their ways. A message, and this is what we have to take from it today, you might read it and think, oh, that's irrelevant. Mm. But the fact is, it's irrelevant today as it was back then. Stop sinning and change your ways. And ultimately, because people do not heed his warning, God points to a time when the Messiah, Jesus Christ, will come to redeem a fallen mankind back into relationship with him. Okay, let's just uh, bow our heads and close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for today. Lord, I just pray that uh, your word that's spoken today opens people's minds, Lord, that we come away from this notion of condemning and rather focus on educating. Lord, you know, Jesus walked on this earth as teacher, as rabbi. He came to give insight and understanding. He came to fulfill the prophecy and the law. He came to show what was good, not what was bad. And so, Lord, as Christians today, may we change our hearts with that view that somebody's Bible version is wrong. May we change our hearts that if they don't baptize a certain way, that they're not Christians and all this nonsense that's going on, this pharisaical rubbish that we live with. Lord, may people in social, not use social media as a tool to put their point of view across, using scripture as their armour in an out of context method. But Lord, let just your word itself seep into our bones. Let it change our hearts. Let it stimulate our minds. Let it reveal what you have to say to each and every one of us. And let us also remember the historical aspect, Lord, that you put your word together to show us what happened to people in the past when they didn't obey you. At the end of the day, we're very blessed today because you sent your son, Jesus, to die on the cross for us so that we could have a blessing like these people never understood. So, Lord, may we embrace this today. May we embrace this word. May we create great joy in reading and learning your word, Lord, and the fellowship that comes that, as a body of people together, that we can enjoy a common belief, a common faith, and an understanding that we serve a mighty, mighty God. So, Lord, we thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Amen.